Shalom Hadavarnix. Welcome to our next session in the book of Isaiah. We're in session number 37 as we work our way through Ariel's exegetical outline notes on the book of Isaiah. Let's do a quick review of where we were last session. Last session we uh, saw that we had divided the second half of Isaiah into three basic divisions in chapter 40 verse 2. The, div the divisions consisted of her well warfare has ended, we've been through that section, her iniquity has been removed, we finished up that section, and now we're just starting the third section, she has received double for all her sins. So let's review sections 1 and 2 just by way of getting ourselves up to speed here. First of all, her warfare has ended, uh, spoke of warfare between the Lord and idols, and also between Israel and the Gentiles. Her deliverance, uh, the warfare included a deliverance from Babylon the near and Babylon the far. The near was deliverance by Cyrus, the far was deliverance by Messiah. And we also saw that Babylonian idolatry would be overthrown, and this was developed in chapter 40 through 48. Then we looked at the section, uh, her iniquity has been removed. We saw that the sin was pardoned by the substitutionary sacrifice of the servant of the Lord. And, so, and we saw a contrast between the suffering of the servant and his future glory. We also saw a contrast in the exaltation of the servant of the Lord from humiliation to glory and honor. But we also learned that there would be an exaltation of Israel to the height of her calling to be a light to the Gentiles. This was developed in chapter 49 through 57. And now we come to our new section, she has received double for all her sins. We'll see a contrast between Israel as a whole and the faithful remnant within the nation. We'll also look at the conditions of participation in the future redemption and glory of Israel. This will be developed in chapter 58 verse 1 through the end of the book, chapter 66 verse 24. Now as we start into this section, let's take a, an overview of chapters 58 through 60, the first few chapters here. In 58, 1 through 59, 8, we will see that Israel's sins have been made very, very clear. Then in chapter 59, verse 9 through 15, Israel will acknowledge and confess her sins. That will lead to God's intervention. God will intervene to save Israel spiritually and physically by means of the Messiah's second coming, chapter 59, 15 through 21. And then the section will close with the establishment of the kingdom in chapter 60. So that's where we're going. So we move from the kingdom in chapter 7 verse 14 into the tribulation period as we enter chapter 58 and verse 1. Of course we're developing the section she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. So we're dealing with the tribulation period and we're following a very important uh, progression. The progression begins with uh, an ex explanation of Israel's national wickedness and f uh, dealing, uh, doubling down now on the true and the false fast in verses 1 through 9 of chapter 58. And so there's a commission given to Isaiah to declare to Israel her sin in chapter 58 verse 1. Cry loudly, do not hold back, raise your voice like a trumpet and declare to my people their transgression and to the house of Jacob their sins. So Isaiah is given a commission to cry aloud, to bellow at the top of his lungs. The Hebrew uh, means, means to make it loud and clear like a shofar bla blast. And what is to be declared so very loud and so very clear is Israel's sins. So this is the beginning of the, the progression. This is step one. Israel's sins are going to be made very, very clear. In verse 2 we come to the hypocritical state of the nation. Yet they seek me day by day and delight to know my ways. As a nation that has done righteousness and has not forsaken the ordinance of their God. They ask me for just decisions. They delight in the nearness of God. So they act as if they had not turned away from the Lord. They seek me daily. They delight to know my ways. They ask for righteous judgments. It all sounds good. They delight to draw near to God. That sounds great too. That's a reference to temple worship. Uh, and we know that the um, temple will be rebuilt and functioning by the middle of the tribulation. So we, uh, we know that from 2 Thessalonians 2.4. This section deals with the Antichrist, the man of lawlessness, 
and it says he opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. So the temple is up and functioning. He's going to take his seat in the temple. So the temple will be operating by the middle of the tribulation when this occurs. And that process is already underway. Now here's a website you could go, call, go to called the Temple Institute website. There you would read, Shalom and welcome to the official website of the Temple Institute in Jerusalem, Israel. The Temple Institute is dedicated to every aspect of the concept of the Holy Temple of Jerusalem. At the center and the central role it fulfilled and will once again fulfill in the spiritual well-being of both Israel and all the nations of the world. So you can get to this website www.templeinstitute.org and the Temple Institute has put together a lot of items for the third temple. They put together the menorah that they hope to be using in the third temple. They put together things like the Yom Kippur lots and the vessels for the various lib libations like for example the water libation here and they've even put together uh, musical instruments for the Levitical choir and musicians. So the process of Constructing the third temple is underway. It will be up and functioning by the middle of the tribulation. That's all we can say. We may see it up and functioning earlier than that, but at the latest by the middle of the tribulation. But the nation here is uh, returning to the tribulation here. The nation keeps the letter of the law. They participate faithfully in temple worship. They love the ritual. They keep the fasts. They keep the feasts, but they reject Yeshua. And so now our attention is turned to the false fast in verses 3 through 5. In verse 3, we see Israel complaining. Why have we fasted and you do not see? Why have we humbled ourselves and you do not notice? Now this verse reveals the true attitude of the worshipers. There's arrogance there. There's selfishness there. They're operating on the basis of merit. We've done all this great stuff. You owe us some attention some merit. And the rabbis have uh, added quite a bit of tradition to the fasts and feasts found in the Bible. Let's look a look, take a look at the additions they've made to the fasts. Now the only biblical fast is Yom Kippur on Tishrei 10 in the seventh month. But the rabbis have added rabbinic fasts to the calendar. These are traditional fasts. They, um, they don't have biblical authority. This is uh, put together by the rabbis. They've included, they've added the fast of the firstborn on Nisan 14 in the first month. They've added the fast of Tammuz on Tammuz 17 in the fourth month. Tisha B'Av on the ninth of Av, Av in the fifth month. The, fa the fast of Gedaliah, Tishrei 3 in the seventh month. The fast of Tevet, Tevet 10 in the tenth month. The fast of Esther, Adar 13 in the twelfth month. But well, what does God say about these additional fasts that the rabbis have instituted? Well, let's take a look at Zechariah 7, verses 4 through 6. God says, Then the word of the Lord of hosts came to me, saying, Say to all the people of the land and to the priests, When you fasted and mourned in the fifth and seventh month, these seventy years, was it actually for me that you fasted? So he's speaking here of the seventy-year Babylonian exile where these additional fasts were added to the calendar. Were you really fasting in order to make get a closer relationship to me? When you eat and drink, do you not eat for yourselves? And do you not drink for yourselves? In other words, you're just acting out like your, like your daily, daily activities. And here's the fast that he's talking about. Uh, the Tisha B'Av was added uh, to the fifth month on the ninth of Av to commemorate, commemorate the fall of the temple by the Babylonians. And then the fast of Gedaliah was added on Tishrei 3 to commemorate the assassination of Gedaliah the governor who the uh, Babylonians had um, placed over the nation of Israel at that time. So these were traditional fasts. Now in Zechariah, Zechariah 8 God goes on to say something more. He says, Then the word of the Lord of hosts came to me saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the fast of the fourth, the fast of the fifth, the fast of the seventh, and the fast of the tenth month will become joy, gladness, and cheerful feasts for the house of Israel, uh, for, excuse me, for the house of Judah. 
And so now he's speaking of these particular fasts, the fast of Tammuz on Tammuz 17 in the fourth month, Tisha B'Av in the fifth month, fast of Gedaliah in the seventh month, Yom Kippur in the seventh month, and then the fast of Tevet in the tenth month. These are going to be changed, God says. These are going to be, they're going to, they're going to be changed to biblical feasts in the kingdom. We'll celebrate in the kingdom, we'll fel- celebrate the feast of Tammuz, the feast of Tisha B'Av, the feast of Gedaliah, the feast of Yom Kippur, and the feast of Tevet. The, the things are going to change quite a bit. They're gonna, God's going to change these, rabbinic, these traditional rabbinic fasts into feasts. Well, returning to the tribulation period and verse 3, God confirms that their fasting is only for their own ends and their own pleasure. Behold, on the day of your fast you find your desire and drive hard all your workers. So they didn't fast for the purpose of truly seeking a closer walk with God. They did their own thing. They required that their workers work just as hard as ever. And the result is strife and contention. Verse 4, Behold, you fast for contention and strife and to strike with a wicked fist. You do not fast like you do today to make your voice heard on high. So this strife and, and contention and violence that uh, comes as, as a part of their fasting will not be noticed by God. That is not what he wants. And so he asks a question. God asks a question in verse 5. Is it a fast like this which I choose, a day for a man to humble himself? Is it for bowing one's head like a reed and for spreading out sackcloth and ashes as a bed? Will you call this a fast, even an acceptable day to the Lord? So God's question, did I require you to fast simply for an outward show of humility? Is that all a fast means, an outward show of humility and nothing more? Is that what I call an acceptable fast? And now in verses 6 or 9, he begins to speak of what is an acceptable fast. Now, the definition of fasting. Fasting means to abstain from food and use the time for spiritual purposes. That's the basic idea of fasting. But does God want us just to abstain from food? Well, actually, he wants us to abstain from more important items than food. In verse 6, is, it not, is this not the fast which I choose to loosen the bonds of wickedness? So he wants us to fast from evil. We need to abstain from evil. That's a more important idea. In verse 6 as well, he says, to undo the bands of the yoke and to let the oppressed go free and to break every yoke. So another thing to abstain from is oppression. Free the oppressed. Do not, uh, do not involve yourself in any kind of oppression. Physical oppression, emotional oppression, any kind of manipulation of any sort. Don't participate in those uh, items. In verse 7, another item of God's fast is to take care of the poor. Is it not to divide your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house? Then you will, when you see the naked, to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh. So we're to use the time to abstain from apathy and to abstain from self and to care for the poor and to care for our family. That's the kind of fast God wants. Abstain from evil, abstain from oppression, take care of your family, take care of the poor. That's the kind of fast that I'm interested in. And if it does, if you do, if you do uh, follow my uh, instructions here, uh, you'll, see, you'll see results. And those results come out in verses 8 and 9. Then your light will break out like the dawn, and your recovery will speedily spring forth, and your righteousness will go before you, and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call, and the Lord will answer. You will cry, and he will say, Here I am. So the results of true worship, had they been worshiping God in truth, they would have experienced these particular results. They would have they would have been healed, they would have experienced justification, they would have witnessed the return of the Shekinah glory. God would answer their every prayer. God would answer their every call. These were the results Israel was looking for, and rightfully so. But insincere ritualism is not the key to receiving God's blessing, these blessings. So they would not experience these results. And the same is true for believers today. 
you know, we want God's blessing in our life, but insincere ritualism is not the way to obtain it. That's not the way. We need to repent of that kind of thinking, and there are rewards for repentance. First of all, they're in the, the first reward for, our, for uh, <coughs> excuse me, the first aspect of genuine repentance is a negative aspect in verse 9. If you remove the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger and speaking wickedness, in other words, cease to do evil in verse 9, the positive aspect of repentance, and if you give yourself to the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, so the negative aspect is cease to do evil, the positive aspect is seek to do good, and the results are then in verses 10 through 12. Then your light will rise in the darkness and your gloom will become like midday. So the first aspect, the first result is fame. You'll be known for good works. And the second aspect is divine provision in verse 11. And the Lord will continually guide you and satisfy your desire in scorched places and give strength to your bones and you will be like a watered garden and like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. So the divine provision for true worship includes guidance and satisfaction and strength and beauty. That's the picture provided by the garden. And, and uh, the metaphor for prosperity and well-being is a spring of water that never fails. So they experience all these blessings, plus they'll be able to restore the land in verse 12. Those from among you will rebuild the ancient ruins. You will raise up the age-old foundations. You will be called the repair of the breach, the restore of the streets in which to dwell. So they will build up the land, they'll build up the waste places, they'll raise foundations, they will be called, they will be praised as the repair of the breach and the restorer of the past on which to dwell. So here God ends his comments in regard to true fasting. And the nation is not fasting in the way God wants the nation to fast. Now he turns his attention to the rewards of Sabbath observance, and this will be Sabbath, Sabbath observance in the kingdom. We begin in verse 13 with a, um, excuse me, Sabbath observance in the tribulation period. The nation is under the Mosaic law. The nation is required to observe the Sabbath as part of the Mosaic law, and so they'll be required to do this during the tribulation period. So there's a challenge issued regarding Sabbath observance in the tribulation period in verse 13. If because of the Sabbath you turn your foot from doing your own pleasure on my holy day and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy day of the Lord, honorable, and honor it desisting from your own ways, from seeking your own pleasure and speaking your own word. So the challenge it has a negative aspect and a positive aspect. The challenge is obey, to obey the Mosaic Covenant and they're told to turn away your foot from the Sabbath. The Sabbath is to be pictured as holy ground, should not be desecrated by stepping all over it. They're told to turn away from doing your pleasure. Uh, this is the, the daily business activities, daily work. They're told to turn away from speaking your own words. These are idle words. These are empty, meaningless words, empty, meaningless worship without any meaning to the individual. Turn away from all this. And what's the, t the positive attitude toward the Sabbath? Call it a delight. Honor the honorable day. Unfortunately, the Sabbath is barely tolerated in Israel today, and this, um, this indifference will continue right into the tribulation period. So we are not responding to the initial revelation God gave us at Mount Sinai. We're not responding to the Mosaic law properly. In 14, verse 14, we get we see God's response if they obey this challenge. Verse 14, Then you will take delight in the Lord, and I will make you ride on the heights of the earth, and I will feed you with the heritage of Jacob your father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So they will delight in the Lord, they will have a static joy in the Lord, and they will ride upon the high places of the earth. That's, uh, that's a figure of reaching spiritual heights. It's a figure for spiritual uh, honor and influence and power. So they'll reach the high places of the earth. And they'll feed on the heritage of their father Jacob. That means the land. The land will supply all their needs. So this is a wonderful promise held out to Israel. But 
Before that promise can be fulfilled, a, pr a problem has to be dealt with. This, the problem is the sins that cause separation from God in verses 1 through 9. We now enter chapter 59, verse 1, and we see that the source of the sin problem is not God, verse 1. Behold, the Lord's hand is not so short that he cannot save, nor is his ear so dull, so dull that he cannot hear. So he hears, and he has the power to save. So the problem is not with God. The problem, lists, lists, uh, the problem lies with the nation Israel in verse 2. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he does not hear. So the problem there lies within the heart of each member of the nation. The sins are then, are then elaborated in verses 3 through 8. Beginning in verse 3, the totality of the corruption is emphasized. For your, hands have defiled, for your hands are defiled with blood and your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken falsehood. Your tongue mutters wickedness. So the hands and the fingers speak of corrupt deeds. The lips and the tongue speak of corrupt words. And unfortunately, all this sin is deliberate. In verse 4, no one sues righteously and no one pleads honestly. They trust in confusion and speak lies. They conceive mischief and bring forth iniquity. <clears throat> so none of this is done in ignorance. It's all deliberate. In verse 5, we see that we see the results of this kind of sin. It produces anguish and poison. They hatch adder's eggs and weave the spider's web. He who eats of their eggs dies. And from that which is crushed, a snake breaks forth. So this sin just produces poison and anguish. You see the adder there, speaking of the adder's egg, the adder there is an extremely poisonous snake. In addition, in verse 6, the sin is valueless. Their webs will not become clothing, nor will they cover themselves with their works. Their works are works of iniquity, and an act of violence is in their hands. So this sin is like spider webs. Spider webs can't cover much. The figure in view here is using a spider web as a piece of cloth. It's not going to do the job. This sin is also destructive in verse 7. Their feet run to evil, and they hasten to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity. Devastation and destruction are in their highways. So these, these deeds are all premeditated and destructive, and the results repeated in verse 8. They do not know the way of peace. There is no justice in their tracks. They have made their paths crooked. Whoever treads on them does not no peace. So the key result is they don't know the way of peace. They have no peace with man, they have no peace with God. When a culture is uh, acting like this, there is no peace between man or God, and there is no justice as well. All their paths are crooked, they're dishonest, they are fraudulent, and those who follow these paths don't know peace. So this is very, a very unflattering description of Israel prior and during the tribulation period. But now in verse 9 through 15, there's a tremendous change. Israel confesses the truth of these accusations. So this is the progress of the chapters. Israel's sins have been made very clear, and now Israel is going to acknowledge and confess her sins. Now, starting in verse 9, we come to the second step of the progression. Israel cries out, therefore justice is far from us and righteousness does not overtake us. There's, an, uh, there's a recognition here that Israel is involved in deep trouble. Israel is involved in calamity. There's no justice nor righteousness. The second part of verse 9, there is no light. We hope for light, but behold darkness for brightness, but we walk in gloom. So there's no justice, no righteousness. Everything is filled with darkness and obscurity. All is black. They're experiencing spiritual blindness in verse 10. We grope along the wall like blind men. We grope like those who have no eyes. So they can't see the way ahead. And they're spiritually dead in verse 10. We stumble at midday as in the twilight. Among those who are vigorous, we are like dead men. 
In addition to this, there is no justice or salvation for the, for the nation. Verse 11, all of us growl like bears and moan sadly like doves. We hope for justice, but there is none. For salvation, but it is far from us. So there's no deliverance from this uh, terrible condition they find themselves in. The consequences of Israel's sin is then brought out in verses 12 through 15. First of all, Israel's sins testify against the nation in verse 12. For our transgressions are multiplied before you, and our sins testify against us. For our transgressions are with us, and we know our iniquities. We understand now in verse 13 that the sins are against God. Transgression and denying, transgressing and denying the Lord and turning away from our God, speaking oppression and revolt, conceiving in and uttering from the heart lying words. So the sins are against God primarily and against men uh, secondarily. In verse 14, Israel understands that justice and truth are lacking. Justice is turned back and righteousness stands far away. For truth has stumbled in the street and that brightness cannot enter. Justice and righteousness and truth are personified as falling on their face in the dust of the street. Justice and truth are lacking. And the results are in verse 15. Yes, truth is lacking, and he who, he who turns aside from evil makes himself a prey. And this is probably the saddest result of all. Those few, those few who turn to God are now attacked by their former friends. It happens all the time. Those who, who um, turn to God are now attacked by their former friends. So the situation is so bad that God has to intervene. So this is the progression. Israel's sins are made very clear. Israel acknowledges and confesses her sins. And so now God intervenes to save Israel spiritually and physically by means of the Messiah's second coming. So the need is found in verses 15 and 16. The first missing item is justice, verse 15. Now the Lord saw, and it was dis displeasing in his sight that there was no justice. So the Lord is very displeased. The second problem the Lord sees is there's no man to stand beside Israel. And he saw that there was no man. It was astonished that no one, there was no one to intercede. People, nobody's interceding for the nation in this horrible situation. We'll see this again when we get to Isaiah 63. And so as a result, God decides to act. Then his own arm brought salvation to him, and his righteousness upheld him. Now the motif of God's arm is a reference to the Messiah, the servant of the Lord. God is now going to act. He's going to send the servant of the Lord to intercede for Israel. And so as we come to verse 17, we've witnessed the servant's preparation for war. He's going to enter into a battle here. Verse 17. He put on righteousness like a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. And he put on garments of vengeance for clothing and wrapped himself with zeal as a mantle. <clears throat> so the, the, um, the servant's breastplate is a symbolic of righteousness. Righteousness means to live by a standard, God's standard in this case. His helmet is symbolic of salvation. His garments, symbolic of vengeance. His mantle, symbolic of zeal. Now, the Apostle Paul, Rabbi Shaul, picks up this picture and expands the thought in Ephesians 6.14, and he does so using a Roman soldier. He does it for those of us in the church. In Ephesians 6.14-17, through 17, Rabbi Shaul says, Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth. There's truth. Truth is a belt around a waist in which all the equipment hangs. So uh, the belt is a symbol of the truth. Having put on the breastplate of righteousness, the breastplate is the soldier's main armor protecting his vital organs and his chest. So the breastplate speaks of righteousness, living by God's standard of behavior. Having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of, pe of peace. Now he turns his attention to the shoes or the sandals that the soldier wore. These are symbolic of evangelism. Symbolic of evangelism, the gospel of peace. In addition to all, taking up the shield of faith. So the shield, a main defensive weapon as well for the soldier. It's symbolic of faith. And what can faith do? 
with which you will, able, you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Then verse 17, take the helmet of salvation. Uh, again, a key defensive area. <coughs> key defensive piece of equipment. The helmet, symbolic of salvation. And then the sword of the spirit. This is the only, this is the only um, uh, offensive weapon that he's mentioned. And the sword is a symbolic of the Bible. The sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So that is how a well-equipped soldier for the Lord is equipped. And so the servant is well-equipped as well as he prepares to wade into battle against Israel's enemies. Then as we come to verses 18 and 19, we encounter the punishment of the wicked. They receive just recompense in verse 18. According to their deeds, so he will repay. Wrath to his adversaries, recompense to his enemies, to the coastlands he will make recompense. So he will punish the wicked. They will get what they deserve. That's what recompense means. And the result is in verse 19. And so they will fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun, for he will come like a rushing stream with which the wind of the Lord drives. So the destruction will be the, the result, excuse me, will be the destruction of the Antichrist army in the tribulation period. That reference from east to west shows that this is worldwide in scope and all the nations of the world will bring their men and material, their military men and military material against Israel. We learned that in, in the prophets. And this term, a flood, is a picture of a military invasion. That's co uh, commonly a picture of a military invasion. So this invading army of the Antichrist during the, tri during the tribulation will be destroyed by the servant of the Lord who is well equipped with his breastplate, helmet, garments, and mantle. And now we turn to verses 20 and 21, and we witness the coming of the Redeemer. We move from the tribulation period into the second coming in verse 20. And so the second coming is explained to us in verse 20. A Redeemer will come to Zion, and to those who turn from transgression in Jacob, declares the Lord. So he will come to Jerusalem, and he will come to those who turn away from sin in Israel. He co he's coming to save the believing remnant. Now the Apostle Paul, Rabbi Shaul, picks up this thought in Romans 11, 25 through 27. He says, I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery, so that you will not be wise in your own estimation that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in until when the last Gentile is saved, Yeshua will return. And so all Israel will be saved, just as, is, as it is written. So at the end of the tribulation, every living Jewish man, woman, and child will place their faith in Yeshua. The deliverer will come from Zion. He will remove ungodliness from Jacob. They will place their faith in Yeshua and receive forgiveness. This is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. And this is all the basis of the new covenant. So Paul is paraphrasing and summarizing Isaiah 50, 9, 20, and 21. Now as a result of the second coming, the new covenant is finally established with Israel. The new covenant is in Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. So the new covenant is finally established with Israel and the essence of the new covenant is individual personal salvation. So the new so two, two aspects of the new covenant are brought out in verse 21. As for me, this is my covenant with them, says the Lord. My spirit which is upon you and my words which I have put in your mouth shall not depart from your mouth, nor from the mouth of your offspring, nor from the mouth of your offspring's offspring, says the Lord, from now and forever. So the first aspect is that the Spirit will not depart from Israel anymore. 
permanent indwelling by the Spirit. And secondly, the word will not depart from Israel's mouth, as it has in the past and as it is today, will be, will be permanently clinging to the word of God and to the extent from that generation on, all Jews forever will become uh, believers and there'll be no more apostasy in the nation of Israel. No more apostasy. And the extent of that, uh, of the new covenant is all br also brought out in Jeremiah 31 as we move to verse 34. They will not teach again each man his neighbor and each man his brother saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. All right, so now we move into an, uh, another time frame. We now move from the second coming and we move into the kingdom in chapter 60, verses 1 through 22. We get a look at Israel in the kingdom. So this is the progression of the chapters. Israel's sins are made very clear. Israel acknowledges and confesses her sins. God intervenes, and now we establish the kingdom. So we begin in chapter 60, verse 1, now as we enter chapter 60, with the coming of the Shekinah glory light. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Your light has come. That's an answer to the promises of verse 58.8 and 59.9. And the glory of the Lord is the Shekinah glory. And uh, we know there will be five manifestations of the Shekinah glory in the Messianic Kingdom. First of all, it will appear in the Holy of Holies in the Millennial Temple, Ezekiel 43. Secondly, it will appear over Millennial Mount Zion, Isaiah chapter 4, way back in Isaiah 4, we saw that. Third, it will appear around Jerusalem as a wall of fire in Zechariah 2. Fourthly, it will be with Israel, Isaiah 35, and here's our chapter, Isaiah 60, verses 1 through 3. And finally, it will appear in the person of Messiah Yeshua in Zechariah 2, 5. And again, I love this picture. Here is a picture of the Shekinah glory over Mount Zion and around Jerusalem as a wall of fire. Nice illustration. I think this artist did some great stuff. I really enjoy her illustrations of scripture. But this light will come, but it will not come until the darkness reaches its greatest blackness. In verse 2. For behold, darkness will cover the earth, and deep darkness the peoples, but the Lord will rise upon you, and his glory will appear upon you. So darkness will cover the earth, and gross darkness the peoples. This is a, re uh, a reference to the last tribulation blackout, when the darkness is at its greatest extent. But when darkness is at its greatest extent, the Lord will rise upon you and the glory of the Lord will be seen. This is the second coming and Matthew picks this up in Matthew 24. In, but immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from the sky and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. And the result of the second coming will be the fact that Israel becomes the center of Gentile attention in verse 3. Nations will come to your light and the kings to the brightness of your rising. So, uh, Israel will become the economic, political, and spiritual capital of the planet during the Messianic Kingdom. And the Gentiles will be attracted to Israel. And uh, this attraction is laid out in a process for us. So the process of the, this attraction starts with the first step, which is the regathering of the Jews by land in verse 4. Lift up your eyes round about and see. They all gather together. They come to you. Your sons will come from afar, and your children and your daughters will be carried in the arms. So that's the regathering of Israel by land. Step two is the wealth of the nations being brought to Israel. Then you then you will see and be radiant, and your heart will thrill and rejoice, because the abundance of the sea will be turned to you, and the wealth of the nations will come to you. 
So Israel, which was impoverished during the tribulation, is now enriched in the kingdom. Now some of the nations who bring their wealth and praise to the Lord are named in verse 6. A multitude of camels will cover you, the young camels of Midian and Ephah, all those from Sheba will come. They will bring gold and frankincense and will bear good news to the praises and bear good news of the praises of the Lord. And so here's a map of the area. Uh, Midian is named. Midian is the uh, uh, northwest corner of the Arabian Peninsula and a part of the uh, Sinai Peninsula. So Midian, the Mid tribes of Midian were located there. Epha is a tribe within Midian. So it's located in the, within that circle somewhere. Uh, Sheba is down at the south um, southwestern corner of the Arabian Peninsula, known as Yemen today, but that's Sheba, modern-day Yemen. They will bring their wealth to Israel. Those are, those are um, Muslim areas, by the way, right now, but they will acknowledge the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob finally. Verse 7, the flocks of Kedar will be gathered together to you. The rams of Nebaioth will minister to you. They will go up with acceptance on my altar and I shall glorify my glorious house. So again, as we return to our map, Kedar is just the kind of a generic term for all the Arabic tribes that are scattered across the Arabian Peninsula. So that's Kedar. Uh, ne Nebaioth is a reference to the Nabataeans, and Nabatea was located approximately here. Today, the modern name would be Southern Jordan. Now, verses 1 through 7 were all statements. And verse 9 is a statement. But verse 8 is a little different. Verse 8 is a question. Let's see what verse 8 reads. Who are these who fly like a cloud and like the doves to their lattices? Well, uh, verse 8 is a question. As though Isaiah can't comprehend what he sees. He doesn't have the vocabulary to explain what he sees. Some things, people are flying in the air. People are coming in the air. Is this a reference to airplanes? Could it be a reference to angels? Well, I think Matthew 24, 31 answers those questions. And he will send forth his angels and a great trumpet with a great trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds, from the one end of the sky to the other. So I think this is probably a reference to seeing angels carrying Jewish people, returning them to the land of Israel. Then he speaks about the ships of Tarshish in verse 9. Surely the coastlands will wait for me. The ships of Tarshish will come to me, will come first to bring your sons from afar, their silver and their gold with them, for the name of the Lord your God and for the Holy One of Israel, because he has glorified you. Now as we return to our map, Tartish, Tarshish were Phoenician trading colonies in Spain, North Africa, and England. And so the ships of Tarshish will return Jewish people to Israel by sea, by sea. And they will do it. They will bring their wealth, and they will do it because God has glorified Israel. So the Jewish people will be returned to the land of Israel by land, by sea, and by air. Israel regathered by all three modes of travel. And in the kingdom, the Gentiles will be subservient to the Jewish people. This is pointed out in verses 10 through 14. First of all, Jerusalem will be rebuilt by Gentile aid in verse 10. Foreigners will build up your walls and their kings will minister to you. So Jerusalem, destroyed by the Gentiles during the tribulation period, is now rebuilt by the Gentiles. And why? Verse 10, for in my wrath I struck you, but in my favor I had compassion on you. So in my wrath speaks of the tribulation period, that um, Jerusalem is ruins because of the tribulation period and needs rebuilding. That's God's wrath. But in my favor I had mercy on ye, on thee. Now God uses the Gentiles to aid Israel and rebuild her rather than destroy her. And Jerusalem's gates will remain continually open so that the wealth of the nations can be brought in, in verse 11. Your gates will be open continually. They will not be closed day or night. 
so that men may bring to you the wealth of the nations with their kings led in procession. So there will be Gentile pilgrimages to Jerusalem, especially for the Feast of Tabernacles. We learned that in Zechariah 14. Then it will come about that any who are left of all the nations that went against Jerusalem will go up, will go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to celebrate the Feast of Booths. And here's a, another drawing that I love. Here's a people from every tribe and tru tongue and nation going up to Millennial Mount Zion to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. And you can see this illustration does illustrate the Feast of Tabernacles because there you see to the right and left, you see the Jewish people building their booths, their tabernacles, their sukkah, their sukkot. So there'll be many Gentile pilgrimages up to Jerusalem. And there'll be a punishment on those Gentile nations who refuse to serve Israel in verse 12. For the nation and the kingdom which will not serve you will perish and the nations will be utterly ruined. So this is an example of the fact that there'll be sin in the kingdom, there'll be a measure of sin in the kingdom, and Yeshua will have to rule with a rod of iron, with power. For example, Psalm 2, I will surely tell the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance and the very ends of the earth as your possession. And there's Yeshua ruling as Messiah King over the world. And how does he rule? You shall break them with a rod of iron and shall shatter them like earthenware. So Yeshua is going to have to rule with power. Revelation 12, 5, speaking of Israel. And she, Israel, gave birth to a son, a male child, who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and to his throne. So that speaks of Yeshua. He's the male child. He will eventually rule with power. Revelation 19:15. From his mouth comes a sharp sword so that he may strike down the nations and he will rule them again with a rod of iron. And he treads down the winepress of the fierce wrath of God, the Almighty. And then speaking of believers, of you and I, we read in Revelation 2, 26 and 27, he who overcomes and he who keeps my deeds until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations and he will rule them with what? With a rod of iron. As the vessels of the potter are broken in pieces, I have also received authority from my Father. So believers will co-rule with Yeshua. They'll have all of his authority to rule over the world. Uh, and uh, the rod of iron speaks of a king's scepter. A king's scepter is his symbol of authority. Here we have the king extending his scepter to Esther. Uh, this is his rod of iron, his scepter. Here's another illustration of that same scene. And here his scepter is very clear as well. And the scepter is the symbol of his authority, of his power. And so Yeshua will rule with a rod of iron. Now this punishment, this ruling with a rod of iron, includes the, um, the punishment of withholding rain. It includes drought. This is brought out also in Zechariah. And it will be that whichever the families of the earth does not go up to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, there will be no rain on them. In other words, God will strike them with drought. If the family of Egypt does not go up or enter, then no rain will fall on them. And it will be the plague with which the Lord smites the nations who do not go up to celebrate the Feast of Booths. This will be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all the nations who do not go up to celebrate the Feast of Booths. Then in verse 13, we learn that the temple will be rebuilt with Gentile and aid. Gentile aid. The glory of the Lord, the glory of Lebanon, excuse me, the glory of Lebanon will come to you, the juniper, the box tree, the cypress together, to beautify the places of my sanctuary, and I shall make the place of my feet glorious. So the glory of Lebanon is its cedars and its trees, and God is also going to make the place of his foot glorious. And we get a uh, look at that in Ezekiel verse, uh, chapter 43, verses 1 through 7. There we read, Then he led me to the gate, the gate facing toward the east. And behold, the glory of the God of Israel was coming from the way of the east. And his voice was like the sound of many waters, and the earth shone with his glory. And it was like the appearance of the vision which I saw, the vision, vision which I saw when he came to destroy the city, and the visions which were like the vision which I saw by the river Chebar, and I fell on my face. 
And the glory of the Lord came into the house by way of the gate facing toward the east. And the Spirit lifted me up and brought me into the inner court. And behold, the glory of the Lord filled the house. Then I heard one speaking to me from the house while a man was standing beside me. He said, Son of man, this is the place of my throne and the place of the soles of my feet, where I will dwell among the sons of Israel forever. <clears throat> so God is going to make the place of his footstool glorious. Now the temple is considered God's footstool. Now here's an example of what we're talking about. This is a relief of King Sennacherib, the Assyrian King Sennacherib, and you can see he's sitting on his throne. But uh, at on, whoops, excuse me, on his feet there, at his feet you can see his footstool. Now the footstool is the humblest place of the throne because the feet were considered the most dishonorable part of the body. And so that's the uh, the humblest part of the throne right there. I also want to point out, you see um, Sennacherib's face is missing there in the circle. Uh, that's because some soldier took an axe and took a, a whack at the, um, at the uh, relief there and chopped his face off because that's a way of dishonoring Sennacherib, dishonoring someone in a, in, a, in a carving like this. And you can see the other faces of all the servants all around him, they haven't been touched. Just Sennacherib's face has been disfigured, a, a way to insult Sennacherib. Here's a drawing of the same scene by an artist. The artist has added the face of Sennacherib back on there. And again, here is the footstool. In case it wasn't too clear to you in the previous sl uh, slide, here is the footstool. And here is a close-up of that same uh, relief uh, that uh, we just looked at a while back. Here's the footstool, the least honorable part of the throne. Now the Ark of the Covenant is considered the footstool of God. This is the least glorious place of our glorious God, his footstool. This is because this is where the, the uh, shush kind of glory would appear above the Ark. So the Ark is the humblest uh, part of God as he as, uh, as his feet, as he, uh, as he joins man. He is, he is very glorious and he, he humbles himself to come and stand in our presence in the temple, so to speak. That's the Ark of the Covenant. Now this is Ezekiel's temple and the Holy of Holies is located right here. This is where the Shekinah glory will show. This will be the place for the soles of his feet. God at his humblest is here in the temple and his glory fills the universe. His glory fills the universe. So that's a look at the temple and the glory of God in the, uh, in the kingdom. We learn in verse 14 that the descendants of anti-Semites will be subservient to Israel in the kingdom. The sons of those who afflicted you will come bowing to you, and those who despise you will bow themselves at the soles of your feet, and they will call you the city of the Lord, the Zion of the Holy One of Israel. And so Jerusalem will be finally recognized as the city of the Lord. It'll be called the Zion of the Holy One of Israel. Now that word Zion uh, the meaning of that word Zion is kind of unknown. Nobody's really sure of what it means. More than likely it means something like fortress or stronghold. That would be the best guess in the context. So the Jerusalem will be the stronghold or the fortress of the Holy One of Israel. And Jerusalem will also be exalted in the kingdom in verses 15 through 21. This will complete the chapter. The changed condition of Jerusalem is brought out in verse 15. Whereas you have been forsaken and hated with no one passing through, I will make you an everlasting pride, a joy from generation to generation. So once forsaken and hated in the tribulation, but now the eternal pride and joy of many generations. And the nations and kings will bestow their vital energy upon Israel in verse 16. You will also suck the milk of nations and suck the breast of kings. Then you will know that I, the Lord, am your Savior and your Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. Now milk provides vital energy and nourishment to a person. And the word picture here is of a mother nursing her baby. Israel is the child and the gentle mother are the nations of the world. Gentle mother nursing her baby. Quite a de tender picture there. And then finally, Israel will know who their God is. He is their Savior, Redeemer, and the Mighty One of Jacob. 
In addition, Jerusalem will be decorated with beautiful stones in verse 17. Instead of bronze, I will bring gold. Instead of iron, I will bring silver. Instead of wood, bronze. And instead of stones, iron. So he's repeating the promise of chapter 54, verses 11 and 12. Jerusalem will be characterized by peace and righteousness in verse 17. I will make peace your administrators and righteousness your overseers. There's a great promise as well. And so violence and, and desolation will be removed from the city. Violence will not be heard in your land nor devastation or destruction within your borders, but you will call your walls salvation and your gates praise. So violence and devastation replaced by salvation and praise. And then the Shekinah glory light will be the light in the kingdom in verses 19 and 20. No longer will you have the sun for light by day, nor the brightness of the moon give you light, but you will have the Lord for an everlasting light and your God for your glory. Your sun will no longer set, nor will your moon wane, for you will have the Lord and everlasting light, and the days of your mourning will be over. And again, here's that illustration of God's Shekinah glory over Mount Zion, over Jerusalem, providing light day and night, an everlasting light, and the days of mourning are over. And this phenomenon will also be true in the eternal order, in the New Jerusalem. We read this in Revelation 21, and the city has no need of the sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of the Lord has illumined it, and its lamp is the Lamb. And the same idea is brought out in chapter 22, verse 5. And there will no longer be any night, for they will, have, they will not have need of the light of a lamp, nor the light of the sun, because the Lord God will illumine them, and they will reign forever and ever. So this is a preview of the eternal order. And finally, in verses 21 and 22, the status of Israel in the kingdom is brought out. First of all, the whole nation will be righteous in verse 21. That's a big change. Then your people will be, will, will be righteous. Then all your people will be righteous. Let me read that right. Then all your people will be righteous. They will possess the land forever, the branch of my planting, the work of my hands, that I may be glorified. And so they will inherit the land forever because there will no longer be a reason for disciplining Israel. Israel will not be need, needed, need the discipline of diaspora anymore. So they'll inherit the land forever and God will be glorified through this. Now this verse and the word all in this verse is the basis for the rabbi's, um, the rabbi's position that every living Jewish person will always be saved. And this is found in the Mishnah, Sanhedrin 10.1. All Israelites have a share in the world to come, the rabbis say. For it is written, thy people shall be all righteous. They shall inherit the land forever. The branch of my planting, the work of my hands, that I may be glorified. So the rabbis use this verse to substantiate this concept that all Jews who ever lived have a place in the kingdom. So uh, judgment is a Gentile problem. It's not a Jewish problem, they say not to worry. However, the context here speaks only of Jews living at the time of the kingdom period. And finally, we'll close the chapter in verse 22. The nation will grow in number. The smallest one will become a clan, the least one a mighty nation. I, the Lord, will hasten it in its time. So first of all, God will hasten it in its time. This will happen according to his sovereign timing. Here is a map of modern Israel right now. But in God's sovereign timing, the boundaries of Israel will be expanded to meet the needs for the increasing population in Israel. So the boundaries will be expanded tremendously. This will be millennial Israel. <clears throat> and here is millennial Israel superimposed over the boundaries of the modern Middle Eastern nations. We see that uh, millennial Israel will take up a little bit of Turkey, a big chunk of Syria, all of Lebanon, a little bit of Jordan, and a little bit of Egypt. She'll expand north, south, and east, and west. And, that, and then all the tribes will have their portion in the kingdom. The, from north to south, they'll be each given a, a bit of territory, the larger tribes getting more territory than the smaller tribes. So that will be Israel in the Messianic kingdom. We learned that in Ezekiel. Ezekiel 48. So the land is going to increase greatly in number. Now, the rabbis say in regard to verse 22 that if Israel is righteous, 
God will hasten all these events in its coming. But if Israel is not righteous, it will come in its, in its destined time. So this is an admission of Israel's unrighteousness. And this comment really violates the rabbi's position on verse 21. But somehow they don't seem to see the inconsistency. All right, let's close our lesson uh, this session with a quick drush, a quick application. Uh, the theme I've chosen is focusing on the Messiah and his kingdom. And this is very much part of the Lord's Prayer, which, which reads, Thy kingdom come. And Matthew 6.33, which reads, Seek ye first the kingdom of God. So in spite of God's promises, biblically, in spite of God's promises of the Messiah and of the kingdom, the majority of Israel rejects God's promises and practices evil. And only the faithful remnant in Israel exercises faith and accepts God's promises. That's what was happening in the Bible. Well, can you think of examples today, currently, where we focus on the world and act according to our focus in our dress, in our language, in our entertainment, in our morals, etc., etc., etc. Are there times when we focus on the world and that, then act according to that focus? So specifically, write down either where or when in your life you find yourself focusing on the world and acting accordingly. Or write down when and where in your life you find yourself focusing on Jesus and his promised kingdom and acting accordingly. That's where we need to focus, on Jesus and the kingdom, and we need to align our life with that focus. So let's move to a plan of action. Write down something practical you could do in that situation to refocus your attention on the Messiah and his promises. That's where we need to go. All right, well, we're a little over time uh, uh, this session, so we'll call it quits right now. We'll see you uh, next week as we enter the next chapter of the book of Isaiah. Thanks so much for being our students. Thanks so much for being our students. Lehi throat. Lehi.